Are you ready? Are you sure? You ever see the Rocky movies? Remember when, remember when he fought Apollo Creed? And Creed was going around like this. Are you ready for it? It's coming. Get ready. Get ready. Amen. It's been an awesome day. We started 10 o'clock this morning. We started out of Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. Ooh. Hi, Jim. <clears throat> I keep thinking that after talking all day long, I might sound like you did yesterday. Jim had a good croak going on the radio. <clears throat> Amen. And it said that I gave you, this was Luke talking, and he was talking about the gospel that he wrote to Theopolis, and he said, I wrote to you the account of all the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. Now, you don't realize what's in that scripture. I had a page of handwritten notes. That was the scripture number one. And two hours later, we about got through that scripture. Amen? Amen. Then we had a, we met at five o'clock. That was a pretty laid back class. And again at six. I remember when Jesus fed the 4,000. Do you remember that? And it said that Jesus had compassion on them because they've been with me for three days. I've been preaching to them for three days. They haven't had anything to eat. They would be hungry by then, wouldn't they? In Acts, let's see, where was it? About chapter 20 or so, Paul was getting ready to leave. It says that the first day of the week, they got together with uh, all the, the church, and he began to speak to them, and his message continued till midnight. And then somebody fell out the window, That's a bit of a distraction, Ryan. Amen? So he just raised him from the dead, and he continued to preach until the sun came up. I'm just saying. <laughs> because I got more than one scripture tonight, hopefully. Are you ready? You know, last time I was here, <clears throat> God prompted me to tell you that if you'll do your part, and if I'll do my part, the Holy Spirit is guaranteed to do His part. Amen. Amen? In my estimation, there is no such thing as a good preacher without a good... I can't say audience because the audience doesn't participate. But I expect people to participate. But without a good audience, quote unquote, uh, it can't be done because the Holy Spirit will give a teacher something to give, but you cannot give and receive. Somebody else has to receive, amen? Did you do your part? Are you ready? Can we welcome the Holy Spirit here? Are you willing to just welcome him here? Amen. Holy Spirit, thank you. Bless you, Lord. Praise to your holy name. Hallelujah. Oh, God, you're good. Oh, boy. Phil, if I holler, will you get behind me? Phil can't even get up. Awesome. It's going to be awesome. Amen. James chapter 3, in the first verse, he said, Don't many of you be called teachers? Because, he says, we have a stricter judgment. Judgment, if you enter into judgment, it's God chastising you. Right? And the way to... Get out of the judgment is to judge yourself. Amen. In Matthew 23, Jesus said this. He said in verse 8, 
But you do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher. That's the Christ. That is Mashiach. And you're all brethren. Don't call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ, Mashiach, the anointed one. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And Jesus had reason to say this <clears throat> because there's a couple of things about a teacher. And I'm an exhorter, but exhorters teach. And if you're going to teach the word, you've got to be anointed for that. You understand that? Can you believe it? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring you a word in season to the ones who are weary. Can you believe that? Yes. Amen. Then you're in a receiving mode. If you hunger, hunger and thirst after righteousness, the promise is you shall be filled. Amen. But a teacher, if he's anointed, you know how to tell an anointed teacher? An anointed teacher, you're going to teach like Jesus. And he knew how to take the profound things and make them very simple. And he could preach to anybody. And they would get it, and of course it was anointed. That helps. An annoying teacher takes the simple things of Jesus and makes them profound. And, uh, well, you know, it's complicated. Let me explain it to you. I endeavor to be an anointed teacher. And it's, that part of it is easy for me because I'm a pretty simple man. Amen? But the thing about it is the Holy Spirit will reveal to you scriptures. That's how you're able to teach because he reveals it to you. He is the teacher. And that anointing, John says in his second chapter, abides in you. And the anointing teaches you. And you have no need that a man teach you. So if a man is speaking, he must be anointed of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And to stay that way, you have to have some kind of humility. The, it's easy. Remember Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And he said, I received this thorn in my side because of all the heavy revelation that I got from the Lord so that, so that I wouldn't get all puffy. It kept me humble. And I needed the grace of God to overcome that and get through it. Amen? You can get puffy. You can start thinking you know something. You know, for me, it's not hard because I was a really late comer. And I've just, very few years, I don't even know, six or seven years, eight years maybe, that I actually started to follow the Lord. And the thing about it is, if he puts an anointing on you and reveals the word to you, it becomes a burning fire in your belly. You understand? And you, you just can't contain that. But you can get puffy. You can get proud. And pride goes before a fall. And for me, I don't know how it is for other people, but for me, you know, you get to where you can catch your britches on your own pitchfork. You know what I mean by that? Or like Pastor said, Sunday, you know, you might open your mouth just long enough to get one foot out and put the other one in. Ask me how I know that. <laughs> Amen? So I endeavor to keep some kind of humility. Amen? Because it is Christ in me, the hope of glory. Oh, yeah. 
Amen. Well, I can tell you this. I'm just going to skip this page because we're going to have to. How many of you were here Sunday, Sunday morning? Now, if you just taken a casual glance at it, you might think, well, we had a word of knowledge and some tongues, and then we had a sermon. But I'm telling you, it was all one. And it was powerful. There is a secret place. How many of you remember last time I was here and we talked about the one thing? And the last one was the secret place. Amen. God was making a specific call to us. Did you hear him? There's a secret place. And he expects us to be there. We talked earlier today about when's Jesus coming back? Because some people are just hanging in there, just trying to hang on and wait, and he's going to come here soon, and he's going to get me out of here, and that'll be it. But he's going to come. He tells you when he's going to come. He says these, the gifts of the Spirit, they're going to cease when he comes back. And so in Ephesians 4, when it talks about the fivefold ministry gifts, he says they're there to equip the saints for the work to build up the body of Christ until, these gifts are there until that body comes into the full measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is the church without spot or blemish. That is the glorious church. So when we get there, so what do, you, what do we need to do? It, in 2 Peter it says you can hasten that day. You can speed it up. If you're wanting to get here, how do you speed it up? Well, I'll just tell you. <laughs> Amen. I, <laughs> I just ask these questions in class and it sounds about like that sometimes. <laughs> Every now and then somebody will stick their foot out and into their mouth. <laughs> awesome. Amen. The secret place. And then Pastor Larry, he talked about restarting your spiritual computer, getting your life restarted. And guess where you can do that? In the secret place. But there's another strand of this cord. How many of you know a three-strand cord is not easily broken? And so when I first found out, well, shoot, that was like three weeks ago <laughs> that I was going to do this. And then it snowed. And then it snowed. Yeah. I talked to Bill on the phone today. I said, Bill, don't tell the weatherman I'm preaching tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I got to make sure and get there. I thought, man, I was excited about it because I said, okay, I see a need. And so some of these people, they're not coming to healing school. Now, they could. Some of them could. So I'm just going to take healing school to Thursday night. And boy, I was excited about it. I had the message. And then, you know, I found out something a long time ago. Well, I say a long time ago. But I found out that God is actually smarter than I am. Did you ever notice that, James? You're a pretty smart boy. He's smarter than you, too. <laughs> Amen. So he said, no, here, here's what I want you to talk about. And now, after Sunday, I knew why. It's the third strand to the cord. The secret of the reboot. And I also call it the missing link in the church because it's something that most of the church has not learned how to do and the Bible explicitly tells us to do so. And what would that be? I don't expect you to know this, but biblical meditation. Biblical 
meditation. We live in a day when the Word of God is all over the place. It's the easiest thing there is to get a hold of now. You can find it everywhere. You can go to three or four Bible classes, go to church on Sunday, and then get on the internet and fill in what you think you might have missed. But I've come to find out it is not the amount of the Word of God that you hear that matters so much. But it, it are you listening? It is the amount, it's how much honor and consideration you give to the word you have heard. We pray for people a lot. And I've seen too many people that you pray for them the same thing. And then they come back for the same thing. And then they come back again. And I'm personally getting kind of tired of courtesy prayers. Because you, you feel for them. And you want to help them. I've started to ask questions. And I'm telling you, I'm almost appalled about how little faith there is out there. You understand that in Mark chapter 6, it said that when Jesus went to his hometown, he could not. It didn't say he wouldn't. He said he could not do any mighty works there. And he marveled at their unbelief. And immediately he went around the towns and villages around that area and taught. And he taught. And he taught. And he taught. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. But people that hear the word, I've seen this too many times, that haven't grown much in the last 20 years. They're kind of in the same place they were. And this is the missing link. Biblical meditation. Genesis 8, 22. After the flood, God promised Noah, there's not going to be another flood. And as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest will be there. Seed time and harvest is a process. And hearing the word, Jesus says in the parable of the sower, plants the seed into the heart. Study and reading on your own adds a little to it, add a little water. But biblical meditation has as much to do with spiritual growth as anything else once you get that word in you. Romans 10, 17, I already quoted it. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I often wondered, why does he say it that way? And I thought, well, it's just repetition. Listen, you hear? Do you hear? He that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to you. I like to quote Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing God by the word. From the beginning, he said, listen, if you will hearken to the voice of my word, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In Ephesians 4, I believe there's a scripture that says, you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and you have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus Christ. 
Meditation in the secret place is going to bring the voice of God. He's going to speak that scripture to you. There is nothing more powerful than hearing God speak it to you. Amen. And we know that the power of God is in the gospel itself. The gospel is the power of God to them who believe. Faith comes by hearing and hearing God by the word. Amen. So it'll bring you faith. It'll build your faith. <clears throat> in Colossians chapter 3. In verse 1. If you were raised with Christ. How many know you've been crucified with Christ? You were buried with him. Nevertheless you live. And he said he also raised us up together in Christ and seated us together with him. Amen. If you've been raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind, in the New King James it says, set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth. Set your mind mind. I want to go to Romans 8 now and kind of tie this together. Romans 8. There is now, verse 1, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. How many of you are in Christ? That's not the end of the sentence. No condemnation to those who are in Christ who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The Spirit of life. What the law could not do in that it was weak. What made it weak? The flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and on account of that sin he condemned the sin in the flesh. Paul said in chapter 7, he says, if I do those things I don't want to do, it's a sin in my flesh that's doing it. He condemned the sin in the flesh. You know, I found out, don't ask me how I know this, if you start walking after the flesh a little bit and you just let the flesh go for a while the flesh is as bad as the devil and you have got to rule it you've got to put it into subjection amen that the righteous requirement of the law verse 4 might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To be carnally minded or fleshly is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind or the flesh is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That tells me the flesh can have faith, but it cannot have faith in God. The flesh can only place faith in those things that it picks up through the five senses. Amen. Set your mind on the things. Medical, or biblical meditation is one of the greatest ways to renew your mind. That's one of the reasons God tells us to do that. The Word of God that we said we can easily find anywhere you want to look if you dig a little bit. Before revelation, it's just information. But information 
if you will put that together with meditation in the secret place, the Holy Spirit will bring inspiration and bring to you revelation. That revelation coupled with your declaration will bring the manifestation. It's a process. Seed time and harvest. Biblical meditation feeds your imagination. That goes along with all those other Asian words. The Holy Spirit will allow you to take your imagination that God gave you. You know, we can imagine a lot of things, can't we? Just before the flood, God said all their imaginations were evil in all their thoughts all the time. But you can picture your success in your imagination. And biblical meditation will do that. It'll give you vision. Grace and favor. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, I think it's verse 26, it said that Samuel, he grew in stature and he grew in favor before God and man. In Luke chapter 2, it says almost the exact same thing about Jesus. Luke chapter 2, verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. How did, these, how did they do this? And do you think that Jesus had to do it in a different way than Samuel did? I don't think so. How do you do it biblically? In Proverbs 3, it gives you the answer. Verse 1, he says, My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands for length of days and long life and peace will they add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Writing the Word of God on the tablet of your heart. So you have the tablet of your heart and you have the Word of God. How do you write it? What else do you need to write it on your heart? I, I hear some Bible class people out there. Psalm 45 tells you. It says, My tongue, my tongue, is the pen of a ready writer. So your tongue has a lot to do with writing the Word of God on your heart. Amen? That's what meditation, part of the meaning of the word meditation is to speak to yourself. I preach to myself a lot. Sometimes it's just I gotta preach to somebody. Amen? You ever do that, Ryan? Wisdom. James says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask God, who will give him liberally. Do we have anything to do with that, receiving wisdom from God? According to Psalm 119, we do. Starting at verse 97. Oh, how I love your law which means Torah, means the instruction and teaching of the Lord. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, you make me wiser than my enemies. I mean, if you know, that's a good idea. To be wiser than the enemy, amen? For they are ever with me. 
if you've never noticed it, they are. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. Amen? Meditation has a lot of benefits if we'll learn. Learning how to do it probably isn't as hard as learning to do it because it takes a little discipline, doesn't it? To start out with, and as with anything else, it gets better. Let's go to Joshua 1.8. God's finally got the children of Israel to where he's going to be able to take them into the land. And he tells Joshua how to find success in doing that. God has told them over and over again, I've given you this land. Amen? I've given it to you. Now go in and possess it. I've given it to you. Now go in and possess it. What does that tell you? We are saved by grace through faith. By grace, freely given through God's goodness and mercy. Eternal life is the gift of God. Amen. But Paul tells Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he says, Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life. Lay hold of it means to grab a hold of it and, and possess it. But eternal life is a free gift. And he says, I've given it to you. What does that tell us? Everything that God gives us freely through his grace must be possessed by faith. Amen? Amen. And so he's telling Joshua how to do that. In Joshua 1.8, this book of the Torah, my teaching and instruction shall not depart from your mouth. So he's speaking the word, isn't he? But you shall meditate on it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Now, this is not making declarations. This is meditating the word. And, and he's using his tongue and his mouth and speaking that word to himself. Amen? So that you may observe to do it. That word observe is shamar in the Hebrew. It's first in the Bible in Genesis where God puts Adam and Eve in the garden and he puts Adam in there to tend the garden and to keep it. To tend it and to keep it. That is shamar. That is this word observe. So he could have said Meditate on it day and night that you may keep it to do it. It means to put a guard around it and to protect it and to take care of it. The second time that that word is used is in chapter 3 of Genesis where they kicked, kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden and they put the cherubs there and a flaming sword to keep the way to the tree of life. It's guarding it and protecting it. So he's saying, if you will keep my word you'll be able to do it. It gives us the grace of God to actually do what the word says. Which says in Psalm 119, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. It's the same thing. He says meditate on it day and night so you can be able to keep it to do it. Amen. John 14. Jesus said, if you love me, 
Keep my commands. Keep my word. He that keeps my word is he who loves me. And I will love him. The Father will love him. And we will come and make our abode in him. Amen. To keep it. In the Greek, that's tereo. means the same thing. To keep the word. And that's the word that Jesus used in John 15 and in John 14. He says, keep my words. Amen. I like Mary, the mother of Jesus. And what she did with this. In Luke chapter 2, verse 19 and verse 51, both say about the same thing. This is in verse 19. It was after they found Jesus in the temple. You know, he was gone three days. Took them to find him. And it says that Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary kept these things. Suntereo means to keep it in your mind. And she pondered them. That's another word for meditation. She meditated on them. Verse 51, Jesus went down to Nazareth and he was subject to them, but his mother kept all these things in her heart. Kept them in her heart. Pondered them. Meditated on them. Now the word law... Torah, teaching, instruction. In the Greek, the word is nomos. And the root word for that is nemo. And it means to parcel out, especially food or grazing for animals. That, to me, is interesting and awesome. The word... The law, God's instruction, is there <coughs> to graze on. Excuse me. I'm getting the Jim McDermott syndrome. <clears throat> A cow has four stomachs. What does he do with it? He eats the food and swallows it. And then he brings it up and chews on it again. And then he swallows it. And then he brings it up and he chews on it again. He chews on it and he chews on it and he chews on it and he chews on it. And finally it becomes living tissue in his body. <clears throat> I'm trying to think of a word. My favorite word for meditation is ruminate because ruminate actually means to chew the cud. And that's what biblical meditation will do. You will chew on it and chew on it and chew on it until you get it in your heart to where it becomes living spiritual tissue. Jesus said... In John 8, 31, continue in my word. Continue in my word. Abide in my word. And you'll be my disciples indeed. And you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Abide in my word. John 15, 7, he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you will. And it shall be done for you of my Father in heaven. Therein is my Father glorified. Isn't part of our job to glorify God? He's talking about fruit, prayer fruit. Amen. Abide in his word. There's, let's just continue. After you have meditated on that word, it's become real to you. 
and you know without a shadow of doubt what happens when you now you begin your declarations and the Bible tells us to hold fast to your confession the Bible tells us that it is through faith and patience that you receive the promise we live in this McDonald's society where we just kind of like to think we can just get things you know right now but I'm going to show you another place and this is in Luke chapter 18 where the church misses it continuing in the word amen chapter 18 of Luke verse 1 Jesus spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart saying there was a certain city a judge who did not fear God he did not regard man how many of you would like to have that judge he didn't fear God and he had no regard whatsoever for man sounds kind of like the devil to me now there was a widow in that city and she came to him and she said get me justice for me from my adversary and he would not for a while but afterwards he said within himself though I do not fear God nor regard man I'm not going to change the way I am amen yet because this widow troubles me I will avenge her lest by her continual coming she weary me Jesus said hear what the unjust judge said he wouldn't give it to her but then he said I'm gonna to have to just give it to her because otherwise she's gonna plumb wear me out and shall not God avenge his own elect to cry out day and night to him though he bears long with them I tell you he avenges them speedily remember Daniel the angel came to Daniel and he said from the day you set your heart to seek me your prayer was heard but it took 21 days how many of you have figured out that you know there's a battle going on here amen but he said because of her continual coming she's going to wear me out and Jesus said nevertheless when the Son of Man comes will he really find faith on the earth you got to wear the devil out the devil knows you know he doesn't want to go just because you say go he has got to bow to the name of Jesus and he's got to go when you believe in your heart and doubt not amen but he doesn't often go right away I'll say it again ask me how I know I'll ask you how you know amen but he knows you know the devil's been at this a lot longer than you have and he knows a few things and he ain't stupid and he knows if he just can outlast you by one second he's got you so you never quit you never give up you know what the word says you meditate on it until it is so real it can't be beat out of you with a ball bat you stand on it and you stay there amen wear him out he'll leave when you wear him out amen I know that uh, F.F. Bosworth when he was giving advice to T.L. Osborne and T.L. he was like 25 and I think Bosworth was like 75 and he said when you go out to these places he said just stay there long enough and preach the gospel day after day until you wear out the devil 
Because when you do, he'll leave town and you can get them all healed. Amen? So, that's why Paul says, having done all, stand. Amen? We sometimes wonder, why won't God take care of this devil for me? Paul said the same thing. He said he asked Jesus three times, didn't he? And what did Jesus tell him? My grace is sufficient for you. God chose, he knew how he wanted to do it. And he chose to whip the devil through people who choose to love him and serve him. Amen? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this. How many of you know that in any scripture you can pick out, there's more than one revelation there if you'll let the Holy Spirit speak to you? Amen? So I'm going to try to approach this a little differently because really I don't want to make you mad at me. And I want you to see this. Do you remember, Sharon, you probably do, when uh, Kathy Mink preached up here and she was, I think it was cold sores or something she was struggling with. You remember that? And she just finally just got so mad at the devil that she locked herself in the closet, put her kids outside and just screamed at that devil. She got mad at him. Matthew 6, 5 Jesus said, be not like the hypocrites. So he's telling them what not to be. Matthew 10, 16, he says, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Ephesians 5, 1 says, be followers or imitators of God, just like dear children. 1 Peter 1, 16 says, be holy for I am holy. In Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, now, get ready. Are you ready? Paul said, be angry. Be angry. Hear what I'm saying now. And sin not. Let not the sun go down on your righteous anger, neither give place to the devil. Okay, we all know you don't want to hold anger against brothers and sisters. Okay? That's the easy revelation of this scripture. Because the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. Amen? But he's given you a command. Be angry. Command number two, sin not. So there is a righteous anger. He says the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. What happens when you add a D on the front of that? You can hate the devil. Be angry and sin not. And don't let the sun go down on that righteous anger. Keep it. Get mad at the devil. Amen? So you don't give place to the devil. You hear what I'm saying? There was an old black and white movie. This must have been back in the 70s, I don't know, 60s or 70s, called Network. And I don't remember much about it. I just remember this one picture. This guy was some kind of a broadcaster on TV. And he had the whole city or the whole county or the whole country or somebody hanging out the windows. I'm quoting this movie. And they were all saying, I'm mad as hell. And I'm not taking it anymore. When Kathy Mink preached that message, I talked to her afterwards. And I said, let me see if I got this straight. You were telling the body of Christ that it is time for us to get up, get mad at hell, and not take it anymore. And she said, yes. I should have got that on tape. Yes, get mad at hell. Don't take it anymore. We have 
some things that listen the devil is a murderer Jesus said so it's easy to say oh this person you know they they died of this disease or that or the other no the devil murdered them the devil murdered them amen Mark 1, 41. And actually, in the NIV is where it says what we need for this. This is when the leper came to him and said, If you're willing, you can make me clean. And the NIV says, with great indignation, the CEB, Common English Version, says, Jesus, being incensed, said, I'm willing, be cleansed. Most of the rest of the Bibles translate that, having compassion on him. Which one's right? Do you think that God is smart enough? We know they came from different parchments that they were translating from. Do you think that God is smart enough to get in the Bible what he needs us to get out of that? Because, you know, we weren't there. I believe that both of those are right. I believe he was mad at the devil. Mark chapter 3. Verse 1. You ever notice all these scriptures start on verse 1 tonight? Isn't that awesome? And he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, as they always did, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Step forward. And then he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? to save life or to kill. But they kept silent. And when he looked around at them with anger, being grieved at the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch forth your hand. He was grieved. Grieved is not anger. He was grieved at the hardness of their heart. Jesus was grieved. When Jesus wept, I believe that he was grieved at the hardness of their heart. How many times did he say, how long do I have to be with you? When will you believe? Where is your faith? Oh, ye of little faith. After a while, that would grieve you, wouldn't it? So he was grieved at their unbelief, but he was angry. He looked around in anger. I believe he's angry at the devil. Amen? Well, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Luke chapter 13. This lady had a spirit of infirmity. This actually starts about verse 11. There was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity. See, I told you. 18 years, she was bent over and she couldn't stand up. She couldn't raise herself up straight. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him. And he said to her, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. He's using the keys of the kingdom. Amen. Whatever you loose on the earth is loosed in that heavenly realm. Whatever you bind is bound. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation. So this ruler of the synagogue got mad at him, didn't he? And he said, because Jesus healed on the Sabbath, he said, There's six days which men ought to work, therefore come and be healed on them, but not on the Sabbath day. So Jesus answered him, Hypocrite! 
you hypocrite? Does each one of you on the Sabbath day loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? Hypocrite. <laughs> Amen. But I believe he's mad at the devil. And I believe he was mad at the devil more than once. Amen. And he was grieved at unbelief. We have some things that we've dealt with for some time. And Jesus just begins showing me some of this stuff now. But he said to me, actually, how long are you going to put up with this? How long will you put up with this? You need to learn to talk right. You ever see somebody hold a conversation with a crooked leg? You ever seen somebody talk to the flu? Learn to talk. Whatever that is, is the mountain in your life. And Jesus said, if you have faith and doubt not, you will not only do what was done to this fig tree, but you will speak to that mountain. You will talk to it. You'll tell it to be removed and be cast into the sea, and you'll doubt not. And then you're going to hold fast to that, and you're going to wear the devil out. Amen. Can you see it? Okay, I think I skipped over just enough to get by tonight. <laughs> oh, you just should have been here this morning. That's all I can say. Amen. I still, I still haven't preached for three days straight, though. Or even till midnight. I got things to look forward to. Are you ready? <laughs> Amen. Awesome God. We are so thankful, Lord. My God, you have sent us your Holy Spirit. Your Holy Spirit is the one who leads us to all truth. Jesus said you have one teacher, and that is Mashiach, the anointing. And he teaches us all things, leads us to all truth, shows us all the things that belong to Jesus, and all that you have, Father, belong to Jesus. And tells us we're joint heirs with him. So I know you're speaking, Lord. Can you believe that, folks? Holy Spirit speaking. Everybody say, speak, Lord. Your servant hears. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So we walk out, doers of the word, meditating day and night so we can be rooted and grounded, Lord, in your love and in your truth. Go with these this night, Lord. I bless every one of them. And let this seed grow up into them and bring forth fruit. I pray in Jesus' name that we may go out as Jesus did. What we have freely received here, we can freely give. So be it unto us, according to thy word, amen and amen. Bless you guys.